So I'll tell you the uh, short, charming story of Narada. When he was born, he was enlightened. Because he was enlightened, there was no birth and rebirth for him since the beginning of creation. This guy Narada has always been there. He's always enlightened. He's always with God, always in divine bliss. He's not happy about this. Okay, Why, you might ask? Because when other self-realized souls gather in the astral and causal plane, they always talk about how powerful the delusion, the maya of God is, and what they had to do to get over it. And they say, what a ride it was. None of the felt left out. He doesn't know what they are talking about. You know, he's, he's missing out. There's this fear of missing out that he has. So he decides to do something about it. He goes to God. Now, God in those days had incarnated on Earth as Krishna. And he was walking among mortals. So he goes to Earth and goes to Krishna's palace and say, oh, Narada, so nice to see you. Lord, I'm not very happy. That doesn't make sense. You are in divine bliss. What do you mean you're not happy? Lord, I'm not happy because I don't understand what Maya is. Will you please explain it to me? Because I feel left out of all the conversations. I say, OK, I see what you mean. But it cannot be explained. You have to experience it. Come with me. So Krishna and Narada start walking. They go beyond the palace precincts, beyond the city, and into the desert. And the, the sun is you know, very uh, hot, and they're walking. Narada is happy. He's walking with God. And Krishna suddenly stops, and he says, I can't walk anymore. His voice is scratchy. Why, Lord? Narada, I'm very thirsty. Will you please fetch me some water? Of course, Lord, I'll fetch you water. So Narada goes off deeper into the desert walks for who knows how many miles, and sees a village. Ah, I have water. He keeps hearing Krishna's voice. Narada, I am thirsty. Please fetch me water. Again. So he sees a well, and ah, I got what I came for. I'll take the water and go back to my Lord. And there, in the well, is a beautiful young woman. And he sees her. He says, lady, will you? He's also thirsty by now. He says, lady. Will you please give me some water? I says, yes, of course. And she pours from her pot. Narada receives the water. He looks up at her. And he is dumbstruck by her beauty. In that moment, something comes over him. And he says, I have to spend the rest of my life with her. And so after drinking water, instead of taking the water back to Krishna, he goes up to her father and says, sir, I have something to ask of you. What? Will you please give me your daughter's hand in marriage? And a man doesn't flinch even a little bit. Says, hmm. He, he looks like a strapping young lad. He seems a decent enough sort. Why not? Sure. You can have my daughter's hand in marriage. But I have a condition. You have to commit to staying here. Why? Well, I'm the head man of this village. Everything you see around belongs to me. And you need to take care of it in my old age and after I'm gone. OK, I'll, I'll stay. And, and Narada gets married. And the idyllic life. Uh, there is not a moment of disharmony between him and his wife. And he, he brings prosperity to the village. The, the crops are abundant every year that he's there. He goes from strength to strength, completely contented. And somewhere in, along all of this, the father-in-law has died. Now Narada is the head of the household. He's the head of the village. He is just so happy. They live a moderate life. They help other people and so on. And then one day, the clouds come, dark clouds, so dark that even the sun is obscured. It feels like night in the middle of the day. And the rain begins to fall. It's like an apocalyptic deluge. And within hours, all the farmland is inundated. The rice crop of this year is completely spoiled. And a few hours after that, the rain is so great that the river begins to flood. And the village begins to get washed away. One by one, those little houses are swept away. Narada's people, my people, he thinks, one by one they die, despite preparations. And soon, flood comes to his own house, which was a little bit elevated. So it takes a while. 
comes and his family is swept away too. So is Narada. And within a second, he's had four children and two of his children, elder children, they die, they are drowned. And his, the third child, his favorite, she's clinging to him. She's only two years old, in little arm, she's clinging to him. And out of nowhere, a great big wave comes and pulls her away from him. His last memory is seeing his daughter's terrified eyes as she swept away into the dark depths. In the meantime, the mother is holding the youngest child, the little boy, and she's struggling mightily, but she too loses the battle and drowns. And in just a few hours, Narada, who came to this village to fetch water, and it started this great life of contentedness and happiness, the same water came in and took it all away just like that. Narada is inconsolable. He's wailing. How can I live without you? He thinks about his family. And in amidst the din of rain and the thunder and the lightning and his own wails, he hears a thin voice in his right ear. Narada, I am thirsty. Will you fetch me water? And the voice grows stronger. And then soon Narada looks up. There is Krishna standing in front of him, smiling. Narada falls at his feet, sobs his heart out. He says, Lord, please, I cannot live without my family. I let down all the villagers, bring them back to life. If not, kill me. I can never be happy again. Krishna says, nonsense. He taps Narada in his forehead gently. And it's as if Narada wakes up from a dream. He startles, looks around, the water's gone. It's just the sand of the desert, and Krishna is standing there. And then Krishna and all his pain and suffering is disappearing, just like when we wake up from a nightmare. You're there and say, oh, what a ride it was. There's only a dream. And Krishna, his, his eyebrows are dancing, his eyes are twinkling. He says, Narada, what do you think of the power of my maya? Narada says, Lord, the depth and complexity of your maya is fathomless. Thank you for con constantly calling out to me. Otherwise, I would have never come out of it. So let's break this story down a little bit. When do you think Narada's pain and suffering started? When did, be, when did it become inevitable? When the rains came? When his family died? No, it started much before. It was that moment when he goes and commits to his future father-in-law that I will turn away from God, I will turn away from Krishna, and I will stay here because getting married to your daughter and staying with her for the rest of my life, that is how I measure my happiness. So it's that commitment away from God that is Maya and Avidya. So that is the more he said, my family, my village, my tribe, the less he understood, the less he comprehended what his reality was. The light shineth in the darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not. That's what the gospel writer is, is, is saying. Now, the beauty of this whole system is both the light and the darkness are within us within the astral spine, the Ida, Pingala, and the Sushumna. And in the Sushumna, there are these two poles. The light of God that shineth is here, and the darkness that it shineth in is at the base of the spine. Our commitment to resolutely turn away from God, to seek separateness, is the power of Kundalini and is a uh, entrenched vitality, irresistible vitality that exists. It pulls us down. But the beauty of this system is that we are predisposed for the light to win over darkness. Eventually, it will relentlessly. Krishna keeps calling. Narada, I am thirsty. Where is my water? Keeps calling. And when we are completely frustrated with everything outside, all we see is the floodwaters of destruction. 
then all the outward sounds and sights become disgusting. And the only thing that remains is, Narada, where is my water? We begin to hear the sound of God, but eventually that will happen. But the masters of our path and the masters of every path have said, don't wait for it, hasten that process. And what can we do to hasten that process? We actively reach for the light. The entire spiritual path, what we do, the path of Kriya Yoga, for those of us that are Kriya Yogis, the path of meditation in general, is a way of turning away from the senses and sitting there to see or wait for the light to appear. So we are reaching for the light when we meditate. When we do seva, serving others, we share whatever light that we see and thereby make it bigger. We reach for it even more. Living harmoniously among people in communities or within family. The ego gets rubbed and dissolves just a little bit more. It gets sandpapered a little bit and we reach for the light a little bit more. But there is another very beautiful thing about this. About a month and a half ago, I was stuck in a rut of negativity. You know how that happens, it just comes out of nowhere and takes over your life. Even meditation, which was often my sanctuary, they were not deep. Uh, I couldn't get away from my mind. So I, after about a week of this, I got really sick of my mind. Uh, but where can you go to get away from your mind? Nowhere, because it's always there. The darn thing is always there with you, right? So. Uh, and then one day I really asked Master, I said, Master, please uh, make this better. And it was a sincere request simply because I was so frustrated. I, there's nothing I could do. And then that morning I was, I was practicing yoga and right in the midst of a fairly complicated yoga pose, I had this clear thought that landed from nowhere. It just landed in my mind. Therefore, I know that I didn't think it. Uh, and and like I wrote it down, it, it was clear enough. Uh, and uh, it said uh, that the strong thought was, it said that my consciousness is stuck lower in my spine. I need to raise it up. And this was a very strong thought that just landed. And the bhav, the feeling behind the thought was one of urgency, meaning do it right now, that kind of feeling. So I did, uh, there is a, very inspiring talk of Swami Kriyananda that I listen to all the time. Uh, it's, it's a talk on the, the path of devotion. So I listened to it for a while. I read a few verses from the Bhagavad Gita, which were pertinent to raising the energy and the essence of self-realization. Uh, some master's uh, sayings captured by Swami Kriyananda. It's one of my go-to books. So I read that. And after about 45 minutes of this, this negativity, which was like a sick feeling in my stomach, began to ebb away. And the, all the things that I saw, oh, people said the wrong thing. I put it in perspective and I realized that it was just me uh, reacting from a poor, unrefined consciousness and the fear went away. Uh, and, and it really was a night and day uh, kind of difference. But what was very interesting about this was, it was very non-specific. It's not that I meditated on my problem. And it's not that I tried to find a reading that applied to what I was going through. It was just an act of reaching for the light. It's uh, what clinicians call a non-specific intervention. Uh, and this is uh, what Lahiri Mahashai used to say very famously, no matter what the problem, the disciples came to him and said, do more Kriyas, meaning reach for the light have God experience as a result of meditation. All we need to do, no matter where we are, is to constantly reach for this. So I'll end with this very inspiring saying from Yogananda. He said, whatever comes, good or bad, all will be turned to good if you see God and refuse to acknowledge the power of evil or trouble. Whatever comes, good or bad, all will be turned to good if you see God 
and refuse to acknowledge the power of evil or trouble.